Hello, I'm Sandra Gilman, Chairman of the American Theatre Wing, with our Board President, Doug Leeds. Welcome to today's program. We'll be joined by four leading men of the stage to explore the role of the actor. We'll be back later to tell you more about the work of the American Theatre Wing. But right now, please join us for another edition of Working in the Theatre. The spring of 2007 has brought an extraordinary series of performances by leading actors to the New York stage, and today we're joined by four of those remarkable artists. I'm Howard Sherman, Executive Director of the American Theatre Wing, and with us are Jeff Daniels from Blackbird, Brian Dennehy from Inherit the Wind, Kevin Spacey from A Moon for the Misbegotten, and Liev Schreiber from Talk Radio. Let's jump right into it, and having heard some of the conversation that was underway before we started taping. I want to ask, what do you enjoy more, rehearsal or performance? Liev, we'll start with you. Uh, I, I, they're completely different animals. I, I love rehearsing. I love rehearsing. If I had my druthers, I would, you know, uh, rehearse and then perform for a week and, and run. Um, <laughs> but... Uh, you know, it's 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 not the uh, it's not the performances that I I love the performances. It's it's the hour sitting in the theater before you have to perform that I, I personally find unbearable. <laughs> that's when the, that's when you know the effects of the ravages of time really start to show. Um, but I, I I have to say that I love them both equally for completely different reasons. Um, it, it, it's it's an interplay with actors in rehearsal, and it's an interplay with an audience in performance, and they're, they're very different animals, but I, I love them equally. And Brian, you have a love for long runs, mm. I understand. It depends on the part. Um, I've been <laughs> pretty lucky. <laughs> you know, everybody always says, my God, you won two Tonys. I said, yeah, I won two Tonys for Tony playing for Willie Loman in Death of a Salesman and James Tyrone in Long Day's Journey of Tonight. Uh, you better be right up there in the... In the uh, in the numbers, because those are two of the greatest parts ever written in this country. Now, those parts are fun to do for a long period of time, because you never find the end of them. I mean, you, uh, uh, I did Willie 650 times in the last week I was doing it in London, although you are kind of looking forward to not doing it. Every night, you would see another door that you hadn't opened. Uh, there'd be something, some other place to go. And I, I remember uh, coming back to the States and driving uh, in some place in Connecticut, and all of a sudden something occurred to me. I pulled off the road, and I sat there for 10 minutes thinking about one of the scenes that I was never going to play again in a whole different way. It's uh, a great part will, will give you those opportunities, and you have to <coughs> approach it that way. You, you have to allow everything that happens to you in the day once you learn the words and music, and you learn it pretty solidly at that point, uh, everything that happens to you in the daytime becomes part of your performance, and there's nothing wrong with that. That's good. Uh, I'm, I'm kind of fascinated by the, the whole long run thing. Yeah, I, I want to know from Brian, what happens when you go out there and there are no doors, and today you're doing the show and you just can't I said, find it? I said it has to be a great part. Even the great part. It should also be There's always doors for the great part. There's always something... You know, it's funny, uh, I, I, apropos this, I, I was in Los Angeles doing it, and uh, Ashkenazi was playing at the music center, and uh, there was some deal, where we went to a, a, a party together, and I had, he, at the party he played concerto in D, and I had recordings from him 20 years before. And we got together, at some point we got together, and I said to him, I said, that's amazing, I said, how many times do you think you've played that? He said, and he thought about it, he said, well, that's interesting, because people ask me all the time, and I never can think of it. He said, about probably 10,000 times. I said, well, how, tell me about that. I mean, it's exactly the same question that we're mm. going through here. He said, well, what happens is you sit down at the piano. He said, the, you know, your hands know the piece, your brain knows the piece, your arms, everything, all of the mechanical aspects of the performance is part of you. So you don't have to worry about that. But now everything that's happened to you that day or the previous week 
Everything that's part of you as a result of where you are right now becomes part of the performance. And he said, you realize that there's nothing wrong with that. That's, in fact, what you want. You want those emotions, whatever the joy is or the sadness or the complications in your life, all to become a part of the piece. And I realize that that's what happens when you do a long run in a, pl- in a part. Willie doesn't have to be exactly the same thing every night. I mean, obviously, he's going on this trip to this certain place. But there, his moods are going to be different. His feelings are going to be different. Things that have happened to him can be looked at in many different uh, variations of emotion, joy and sadness and happiness and uh, ec- ecstasy and so forth. And you allow those things to inform the, the performance. And none of them are wrong. They're just part of you. And, of course, what you're doing is part of the performance. So that's one of the things that a long run allows you to do, is to, is to learn that about a character. You don't have to go out there every night and I've got to figure out a way to get to this place. You don't have to get to that place. That place will come to you if you mm-hmm. allow it to happen. So I, I, uh, Jerry Orbeck, the king of long runs, told me that. When, it, when he came to see I said, I said to him, I was two months into the run, I said, God, I don't know how I'm going to do this. God, I'm driving me crazy already. Yeah, that's where I am. He said, yeah, I know, but if you allow... Billy Crystal, I said, well, I saw Billy do 700 Sundays. Mm. About a month into the run, he says, I can't do this. I can't do it. I said, Billy, I said, if you just stick at it, stick at it. Now he doesn't want to stop. He's doing it in Australia. He's, been, he's mm. done it probably <clears throat> done it a thousand times, and he's having a ball. Every time you do it, it's different. It's a little bit like, you know, uh, uh, very often audience members will ask that question. How do you do it every night? You know, how do you get up there twice a day and do it? <clears throat> and uh, the best way I've found to describe it is that if you, if, you, if you take it out of the theater element for a second and think of sports, think of, you know, if you play tennis or you play any game that forces you to work on a different part of your game every time you play a game. Yeah, every time you go out on the tennis court, it's the same rules. You've got to get the balls in the same place. But it's always a different game. And that is the experience that I've had, certainly in doing O'Neill. But I've been fortunate in playing characters like, like Brian indicates. If there is a lot there, and if you are, and, and I think the other aspect of it that, ca- that cannot be excluded is your fellow cast member. Yeah, There's always the anything. aftermath that poisons you, and I don't want you to be poisoned, and I don't you want to be poisoned myself. Not tonight. again, not tonight. There have been too many nights and dawns. I want tonight to be different. Oh, I want tonight. If you've got people on stage that you trust and that you are willing to go to wherever this particular story and play asks you to go, emotionally, technically, in terms of a kind of relationship, if, if you're all climbing that mountain together and you're all up for the same journey, then it's so much easier to get up every night and trust that you can go somewhere else, so that it will still be alive and fresh and fun, and that each night you are, in fact, working on something slightly different. And using the athlete metaphor, do you feel like athletes? Do you have to pace yourself like athletes to do this job? Oh, Liev, yes. you're, you're out there pacing the stage for 100 minutes a night right now and talk radio. You're smoking up a storm. You're, you know, yeah, I'm sore you when I'm done. That? I'm sore when I'm done. I'm sore. Yeah, I, you know, I, I, <clears throat> I think you know within with, with within reason. Yeah, I, but I don't think that for me that's not a long run thing. You know, bringing your day to the show. I mean, that's a that's every that's an every day. Thing. Yeah, that's that's a rehearsal thing. That's a that's you know that's a. Um, but I can see how when you really start to lose your mind, <laughs> and you really can lose your mind doing this, that that's that, that's a that is a. That is a respite to know that it's not just a gig. It's an experience to relate to an audience with a character of substance or a play of substance. And it's this country where culture means pornography and slasher films, where ethics means payoffs, graft, and insider trading, where integrity means lying, whoring, and intoxication. This country is rotten to the core. This country is in deep trouble, and somebody better do something about it. The, the thing that gets me through is the audience, is that uh, is the, the ambiguous exchange of energy um, that uh, I, I still don't understand, but I, I, I've become addicted to. And um, that's why I say, you know, for me, waiting to do the show, sitting in the dressing room, going to the theater, those are the worst times. But the minute you step out there, f- for me, I feel this 
there's a there's a palpable uh, something in the air that 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 is it's really remarkable and it, it is not only very satisfying um, but it also it's, it's informative and you feel I feel and I guess maybe this probably was why I got interested in acting in the first place I feel connected to something I feel connected to not only a, an historical continuum but also connected in an immediate way to, to, to people which is something that you know I, I struggle with sometimes, but not in the theater. It's the, it's the, to me, it's the, one of the great um, gifts that we get. And I think it's sort of remarkable when you think about it. You know, people come into a theater, and it's the most artificial surrounding you can imagine. You know, there's big curtains, there's exit signs, there's chairs, there's programs. And yet, somehow, if the elements have come together, right, 20 minutes into a play, that entire group of a thousand people or less go to a world that you're asking them to go to and they believe in that world. Mm -hmm. And that <coughs> collective experience where a thousand strangers come into a building and believe is what to me is, is the great magical quotient of when great theater, great performances happen. It is a shared, it's almost like a breath. Mm. You know, I, we feel the audience. I mean, it, you know, you gauge how a show goes in different ways. We were talking earlier about how, you know, with Colm Meany, who's in our play, and plays Hogan, I think to a large degree because he supplies the, a lot of the humor in the play, Colm naturally gauges the play and how it's going on laughs. I gauge it on silence. Because when I feel an audience absolutely engaged, and believe me, you can tell when they're not, <laughs> you know, there's a collective rustling of asses. You know, everyone's sort of moving and shifting in yeah. programs and whatever. That when you feel an audience absolutely engaged in following a story, and particularly when they'll laugh at things that aren't jokes but are character, then you know that you are sharing this story with them together, and it's an incredibly satisfying feeling. The, the, the idea that... I mean, historically, uh, theater and opera... Well, you know, even... even you know, before theater and opera, the ritual of, of people getting together and collectively watching something. Um, the idea was not just for the performer to be seen, and particularly as you move into opera and theater in its early phases, was for those people in the audience to be seen. And what I find so unique about theater that I love is that something's carried through whereby, you know, you'll get a laugh in a play that if it were in a movie, you wouldn't get. And that's because in the movie, it's, the experience is sort of total immersion, and it's personal, and you're in there, and it's dark, and you're having the experience that the film is, 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 is letting you have. But in the theater, those laughs are more than just acknowledgments of humor. They're a connection between the audience members and each other. I got that. Did you get that? Uh, how's this date going so far? Or <laughs> do you see the guy in the third row? Or how's this? There's a really sophisticated communication that's going on there between not only you and them, but them and each other. And that, that, that thing is fascinating and, and is, is part of what helps generate an authentic interest in, in being there every night. I worry about being there every night. I've got to be honest, eight <clears throat> times a week and all of that. There is an art to it. There really is an art that, the, that we've all worked with movie people that can't get past the third take. Hmm. Can't. I mean, they start to recreate it after that because they can't repeat. And once you've done theater and you learn how to do it eight times a week and make it look like it's happening for the first time, uh, you take that onto a movie set and you're good on take 25 if you've got one of those guys, you know. But the, just the straight film guys can't can't get past three or four, take three or four. <clears throat> I worry about, I mean, Blackbird is such an emotional investment, you know. From eight o'clock on, it's just, we're <clears throat> there. And I worry about cheating the audience. If I just can't, for some reason, get anywhere even in that place, and, and more often than not, I do. But what I've found, and Brian said this earlier uh, off camera, he said, a, a good play will take you there. I don't have to do all the heavy lifting. Mm. And I've walked out where I just, whatever the preparation, I'm, and all of a sudden the play will, if you let it, it'll take you there. It's I a train. <laughs> Being a great play, 
Once you get past a certain stage, and you have to get past that certain stage, and you're still working on it, and believe me, I know, I've been there. But if, once you're, being in a great play is like going to a train station, and you stand there, and the train pulls in, the doors open up, and your feelings can be A, B, C, D. It can be anything. But when you get on the train and the doors close, the train takes you, and you're now on that train. And you will go places whether you feel like it or not. That's what I was saying before. You can allow virtually any group of emotions or uh, feelings to, to be present in you at that point. Because the train is taking you to a certain destination, no matter how you feel. And, and those feelings will all be a part of that trip. And they should be. But and you're, you're going open, to a cer certain point. You're open it to the other uh, people in the Yeah, in the of cast, course. Like oh, very often saying, when I, when I use feel... Them, <clears throat> use them yeah. to take you somewhere else a little bit different tonight. And, and the sudden, playwright, of course. It's a first time, first time experience again. Whenever I feel, and, and, <clears throat> and I have in, in every play I've done, but more recently in, in Moon, whenever I find myself feeling I'm not quite here, you know, I just feel like I'm slightly standing outside of it, I actually stop. I mean, if I've got a move or a thing, and I usually do this, and a line happens, I, do that I actually stop and just take a second and just in my own brain say, uh, really c reconnect with her right now. Like, just, just reconnect with her. And I just allow myself a moment and a breath of realizing that for whatever reason, I'm off the rails. But if <clears throat> you don't forgive yourself very quickly... Mm -mm. Yeah. Then you'll spend the rest of the play <laughs> thinking you didn't do that moment right. Yeah. You've got, I mean, I feel this way about film too, you know. You do it, because movies are all about going and taking and shooting, and it's not about rehearsal or discovery very often, and right. very often you don't get rehearsal. And sometimes, you know, I'll, do, I'll get to the end of a scene and I'll think, you know, I just, I don't know, I, did we guess right? I don't know if we guessed right today. And I find I've got to let go of it, because I've got to come back the next day and keep moving and, and keep, and you hope that in the trajectory of the whole film, they'll cut it together in such a way that maybe if that scene didn't quite go the way it should have. But I find in theater, I've got to forgive myself immediately in order to keep going. And it's about reconnecting and just allowing myself to, to sometimes it's just technique. I mean, sometimes, I mean, even, you know, you go back and read some of the great <clears throat> biographies or autobiographies of actors. They'll say, you're lucky. Jessica Tandy said, you're lucky if you feel it three or four times a week. In mm -hmm. the sure. run. The rest of it is technique and relying on what you can trust, which is the material and your fellow actors. You also have to be very careful about what your assumptions and presuppositions are. I mean, the, there's a great story of Barrymore and uh, Chris Plummer, whom I have the privilege of working with, of course, played Barrymore and knows virtually everything there is to know about Barrymore. Barrymore, when he uh, was going to do Hamlet in London, which is talk about taking the, uh, taking the show on the road, here is Barrymore, the great American profile, doing the great, the great British part on stage in uh, London. So he did exactly the thing that he would normally be expected to do, is he got drunk. And he disappeared for the, uh, the uh, dress rehearsal. In those days, there was a dress rehearsal and an opening night with critics and everybody. He showed up a few hours before the opening and he had a terrible, terrible hangover. In fact, he was probably still drunk. And he went on, <coughs> but he went on sick. He was vir virtu literally sick and he would have to stop in the middle of the performance and go into the wings and be physically sick, vomit, come back on stage, wipe himself off and go on with the play. It was, as far as the producers were concerned and the directors and the other actors, a disaster. He got the most extraordinary reviews anybody ever saw <coughs> Hamlet get because everyone said, what an amazing set of choices to go on, to play this guy absolutely at, the, at his wit's end, <laughs> so physically ill he can hardly get to <laughs> so, you're not. It's like I said before, sometimes they go on, I, like when I do Willie, sometimes I'd be so tired, so exhausted, and you drag yourself out there and you have no defenses. You cannot protect yourself from the part. And you give the best performance mm. you can give because you cannot protect yourself. Mm. You can only be what is required you to, of, of you to be, which is willing. So let me ask you, we, we've been talking about what you all bring to the part. You know, the outside world coming in, the interaction with other actors. Do you take it home with you? 
when you've got a particular role? I never do. Can you turn it I've off? I've learned how not to. I did for a while. No, I'm, I'm not that. Not really. There are <coughs> various wives and girlfriends may say something different, but... <laughs> <laughs> well, I think there is, <coughs> there's sometimes, I, I don't take it home with me, but sometimes in film, I feel like if, if you're doing a scene that's going to take you three or four days to shoot, there is a particular place you have to kind of stay, mm -hmm. just mentally, in order to be able to stay in that track and not get thrown out of it and not have distractions, lose the ability to finish that scene. But in, in theater, I find very much that I, I like to hang it up with a costume at the end of the night and go home and, yeah, me too. and not live it. I, I think like, like, like most, I, I'm sort of supercharged after the performance for yeah. about an hour or two, which is, I think is why there's a, a, lot, of, a lot of stories about alcoholism in the acting. Yeah, business. booze used to take care of that for me, but it doesn't anymore, <laughs> so. Uh. I, I, another thing that I just started to notice, and I think on, 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 on probably on talk radio, is that, um, because I've never thought of myself really as a sort of a method or a sense memory person. I kind of, uh, uh, but I'm, you know, I'm, I'm learning about myself a lot as I go and, and a lot on this play is that I kind of do things, I have physical associations, which I guess is sense memory, but I don't intellectualize them and I don't psychologize them. Um, I'll like ask my body to respond in a certain way and, and then replace that with the character's psychology. And one thing that I've been noticing that's been happening recently is that I think my my body kind of uh, owns things that I don't necessarily want it to own after the show is done. Like I noticed like back pain and things like that or, or tension. Uh, for instance, uh, mm -hmm. crying for me is a series of kind of physical synapses, like a, a respiratory thing that happens and a gag reflex and then then in the emotion follows the physical. I kind of, sometimes I, I find that helps me work quicker to get to something. Um, but I notice that there are odd little aches and pains and things that I do believe in the fact of, that, uh, that there is body memory, that subconscious body memory, and mm -hmm. you, put your pl you put your body in a, in a toxic place. Uh, sometimes it's, it's, it takes your body a little longer to shed it. Well, you do this, it you do this thing when you, uh, when you have that attack on the floor where you, you open your jaw so wide. I, I, mean, I can't even do it now because I get stuck that way. He'll never be able to do it again. <laughs> but I mean, it is terrifying. Uh, and that's obviously part of what you're talking about. Yeah, you know, that, that, yeah. And it must affect your gag reflex. And Because uh, I was looking at it and I said, oh, man, yeah. I don't want to have to go there eight times a week, yeah. physically. You know, I don't know what, what it's effect gold, It's a goldfish thing, you know, oh, gasping for terrifying. air. Is it, do you also, do, do you find that, that, that <clears throat> that emotionally, <coughs> whether it's in the course of rehearsal or the course of a run, that you've, that in order to find the places where this character, you know, like I, I have a character where I have to, I have to discover in myself a level of self-loathing and, and, and disgust at behavior that is so, you know, it's just been so interesting to ex sort of excise it, find it within yourself, try to bring it, so that when I have to find those places in the play where that, that stuff is, is the foundation of that character's emotional life and kind of comes out in these sort of cascades, like a volcanic eruption, I find I do have to sort of dig into places that I might not otherwise want to go. Yeah, I do too. I do too, but it's very cleansing by the end of it. Mm. I've found. I mean, I, I had you got to go to those places, and the bile that comes out in the ninety minutes, and then the curtain call, and it's. I thought I'd be walking home with it every night, but I'm not. It's. I, it's. It's. I get it out somehow. It's cathartic. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. We're, yeah. We're talking so we're talking so much about how hard it is <coughs> to do what you do. <laughs> I want to ask, do you have fun with doing it? even if the part is tough. Now, Brian, you're in a show, you're out there sparring with Christopher Plummer. Is it fun or is it still work? Well, no matter what I do, I seem to lose every night. Um, <laughs> but, uh, well, the I train guess is taking you to probably, a certain yeah, place. That's probably uh, the way that it's written. Um, yeah, it is fun. I mean, the one, I remember years ago doing a picture with uh, Tony Curtis. And this is a long time ago, 30 years ago. And we're sitting in the back of a car, and somebody was complaining about something, and somebody else was complaining. You know, in the back of the car, it's hot as hell. We're in wardrobe. It's out in the back lot in Universal. 
And Tony turns to me, and I'll never forget it. I remind myself of it all the time. He says, you know some we are really lucky guys. This is fun. Look at this. We're all dressed up in these clothes. We're in this old car, and we're going to go... We're going to say, action amen, we're going to pull up, and we're going to drop out, we're going to say all these lines, and we're going to... He says, we're having a good time. Mm. And I said to myself, you know something? He's damn right. <clears throat> never forget that what we do, we're extremely privileged to do. And it is fun. And if you're lucky... And as I said before, if all those elements come together, then what also happens in the theater that I think rarely happens in film is you make families. Mm -hmm. there, there, I have m a closer relationships with people that I have worked with in companies of actors. And stage management becomes a part of your family. And, uh, you know, at the Old Vic, we have a whole staff. I feel getting up every day, going to work every day, it isn't work. I mean, yeah, there are parts of it that are difficult and challenging and, and, uh, and can be emotionally draining, but it is such a joy to find a group of people who are up for the same thing every night. It should be pointed out, by the way, that Kevin, uh, to some extent Jeff too, but, but Kevin for sure, has a real job. He has a day job. He runs the Old Vic Theater, which is a massive... Uh, job with a very high profile in London, and he's done a hell of a job. Uh, I've, I've been to see several of the productions there, and it's wonderful stuff. So he really is kind of a grown-up, uh, <laughs> as far as uh, <laughs> actors are concerned. Yeah, but I still feel 12. Uh, now, uh, Jeff has got a, a similar situation in Michigan, uh, but both of them have taken on these responsibilities, which most of us as actors, certainly me, say, oh, please, God. Uh, let somebody just write the check <laughs> and uh, let me do the acting part. That's the fun part. But running a theater, especially a theater with the, the history and the traditions of the old Vic, that's a tough deal. And he's done a hell of a job. Thank you, sir. But that brings me to a question. You are all actors. You are all known for your success in your work. Do you have to take on other things to keep challenging yourself? Jeff and Kevin, with the theaters that you run, Liev, you wrote and directed a film. Brian, we just saw you making, as far as most people know, your musical stage debut <laughs> here in New York. Yeah, well, I wouldn't. Do you <laughs> have to constantly set new challenges, or is the acting enough? The challenge is to get a job um, they, at certain stages of your careers. I mean, these guys all do this other stuff. There was a time when I did some writing and directing, but uh, nowadays I just try to... Uh, when you, get to, when you get to a certain age, you want to do certain things. I mean, there are certain parts I want to play. And uh, it's interesting to watch Chris every night because Chris is a guy who has been a star since he was 25. That's 50 years ago. On the Bible, what is the biblical evaluation of sex? It is considered original sin. And all these holy people got themselves begat through original sin. But these guys are young, and they can do lots of different things, and so they should. Uh, and, and I'm all fav in favor. I think I, what, what happened with me was I got to a place a a after, you know, I, I grew up in theater. And I always feel that when people say, oh, you know, we love your movies, and we only know you from movies, I think, well, you don't know me. Because the theater is always my primary allegiance. And I got to a point after I'd spent about 10 years really focusing on film. I wanted to see if I could make a career for myself in film. And, you know, at the end of 99, I thought, well, this has gone better than I could have imagined. Now what am I supposed to do? Am I going to spend the next 10 years trying to top myself and stay on this list and do all that jazz? And, and I thought, you know, I don't. What I really want to do is what my heart's telling me to do, which is to actually flip it and no longer be interested in my own personal career, but actually go back and do theater, but do it in a bigger way, in a sense, outside of myself and the satisfaction that I've had in the last five years living in London, starting a new theater company from scratch, uh, which is not easy, particularly in England, because they don't necessarily welcome theatrical beginnings uh, right away. But the truth is that I find being that person who tries to bring all those elements together, and that's really what my role is. You know, I'm not directing the plays. I'm trying to put them together in such a way that I think that director and that scenic designer and those actors will make this work come to life and serve this writer, which at the end of the day is what we're supposed to do. Jeff, is that the same situation for you at, at Purple Rose in, in I Michigan? Just, I, yeah, yeah I, very similar. I, I, um, you know, I, I, I am a theater rat <clears throat> from high school on. I think we probably all were at some point. 
I just look at it, whether it's the executive directing, which is what I do there, unpaid, but the playwriting and the kind of helping and supervising is just living a creative life. I can't wait. Uh, I get tired of waiting for Hollywood to call, you know, and the phone to ring. And do I take this part or that part? Because <clears throat> I'm not in a position this year to, well, it's the lesser of two evils, so I guess I'll take that one, you know. Well, you just get tired of that after a while. And uh, there's no depth to it. And so I, I started the Purple Rose back in 91 and uh, just created this regional theater company that does new American work. That's what we do. That's what I'm interested in. And it's worked. And, and I, I, I absolutely, starting a theater company in the middle of nowhere where Art is a guy who lives north of town, <laughs> is, there's a challenge there. And so, uh, but it's been incredibly satisfying and in a lot of ways has brought me back to the theater now, all these years later, to get on a stage and, and do it here. It's, it's, it's really, I think, just a part of, of living a fully creative life, which I think we're all very fortunate to have lived. One of the big things that ha has motivated me to do a lot of the work that we do at the Old Vic that we've now brought here to New York, which is a lot of educational stuff and a lot of community stuff and a lot of helping emerging talents sort of find a home and a foundation, is that I was the recipient of this stuff when I grew up in California. Because I grew up in Southern California when there was a lot of money in the arts in schools. And then all that money went away. But during, the, I would say from 11 to 19, I got exposed to so much professional work. We used to take class trips. I mean, I met Jack Lemmon when I was 13 years old at a production of Gina and the Paycock where he did a Q&A for us. I met Hepburn. I met all these extraordinary people. We did weekend seminars and Shakespeare festivals and one act festivals. And, and what that did to me, and I know a lot of my fellow classmates, just in terms of those first seeds of confidence. And we're doing workshops here now with a bunch of kids from the New York City schools, and it's not about whether they want to be actors or go into the arts. It's about learning to collaborate with each other, using the tools and the artists of theater in order to teach them how to learn about themselves. And when a kid at 11 or 12 or 13 or 14 starts to realize they can actually do something, they can accomplish something in front of their peers and their friends and their teachers, it is an incredibly satisfying experience for all of us who, who've been through it because I look out in these kids' eyes and I see myself. I know exactly what it feels like to have an opportunity to be exposed to the professional theater. Mm -hmm. And that seems a great moment to take a short break and hear a few words about the work of the American Theater Wing. The American Theater Wing has played a vital role in New York's theatrical life for more than 60 years. We stand for excellence and we support education in the theater. Best known for creating the Tony Award, our work reaches beyond Broadway and New York. These seminar programs, which are supported by the Annenberg Foundation and the Dorothy Strelson Foundation, are an unequaled forum for discussions with today's most creative artists. Downstage Center's in-depth interviews are heard on XM Satellite Radio. Our grant and scholarship programs support New York theater companies and theater students. And since we began, we have given away more than two and a half million dollars. Our theater intern group helps young people who are just starting in their careers build a professional network. And Springboard NYC is a two-week boot camp for aspiring actors from colleges across the country. All of the American Theatre Wing's educational and media programs are available for free, on demand, from our website, americantheaterwing.org. Now, let's return to the seminar. You are all actors who've had the unique opportunity to explore multiple works by particular playwrights. Kevin and Brian, both with the work of Eugene O'Neill, Liev with Shakespeare, Jeff with Lanford Wilson. Is there something unique about being able to go through the work of a particular playwright that, that allows you to do work that's even deeper than just when you hit it the first time. I think there's something about being an Irish American as far as O'Neill is concerned. Uh, both Spacey and I are O'Neill junkies and Jason Robarts junkies. Um, I think Robarts has a lot to do with my 
interest in O'Neill, but now my interest in O'Neill, although I'm too old to play most of the parts, uh, is uh, pathological. O'Neill is, <laughs> O'Neill defies the actor to learn the words. He doesn't give a shit about your problems, uh, even though he's probably more of a poetical writer than he's given credit for. He, he always said, uh, you know, the, the actor has his problem, his problem to solve. I've solved my problem. Now you solve yours. But boy, when you do, it's uh, it's just uh, it's a tremendously satisfying because you go to a place that that's a hard place to go to. I find the thing that about doing a, a playwright's work is that each play informs the other because they do tend to run into each other. And that's sort of a joy. I, if you have an affinity for a particular writer's work, and I do for O'Neill, I, I happen to find his ability to write characters that are so flawed with such honesty and seemingly no judgment. I never feel that he judges the characters that he's writing. Whereas in, with some writers, you do feel you're being led in a certain direction about how you ought to feel about that character. I feel that he just says, hey, man, here they are. There's it's also, it's also a thing I think that's inescapable about O'Neill is that every one of these characters, whether it's Hickey or Jamie in two or three different plays, he's also writing about himself. There's a tremendous amount of biographical content in those characters. The darkness that, are, that is revealed in those characters were obviously darknesses that he felt about himself. And uh, in Long Day's Journey, for example, the one character who is kind of protected is Edmund, although I thought that Bobby Leonard was just amazing in that part. But, but I think that O'Neill deliberately wrote so much of what he was finding out about himself in that amazing, that miraculous five-year period where he wrote all these plays, he was putting those char him, it was so much of himself into, into his brother's character, although God knows his brother was dark enough to have screwed up enough. But there's an awful lot of autobiographical stuff in that. And good writers do that, though. Yeah, yeah. I think so. <coughs> I mean, the good ones do. Lanford. And the mother. Lanford certainly does that, and, and from my end, just knowing him. You can hear his voice. You can hear the cadences and the rhythms, and and I, I agree that 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 play informs that one. In fact, it's it's fascinating, really. And since we're talking now about a living playwright that you've been able to work with and talk to, does that does knowing the person it came from inform the work that you do when you're in his shows? Well, or I mean, if, it's, his if shows? it's autobiographical, in Lanford's case, and when I did Lemon Sky. Um, years ago, uh, yeah, I mean, that was really, he said he wrote it in 36 hours way back when, and you're going, well, okay, tell me about this. I mean, it's, it's in a way kind of just playing him um, with Blackbird, David Harrower. David was very kind of, um, he held back a lot. He would help us, but um, didn't really help to, he was certainly helpful to understand the play, but I, I didn't think that there was anything of the play that was really from David's life. Mm -hmm. It's probably not true of Miller, interestingly enough. Miller, uniquely among the great three, Tennessee Williams, which, who of course wrote coded plays. His plays were coded about himself. And O'Neill, who was the deep diver. Miller was the great observer, it seems to me. He was, he was observed certain things his, in his family, in his friends, in his relationships with other people. But it was not necessarily about him. There are parts of it which are, but they're, it's hard to find. And he's also, was also, as a person, was very careful to make sure that there was a separation between what you knew about him and what was put on stage. So there are differences. Miller was one of the, is one of the ones, one of the great playwrights, who <coughs> was, was careful about writing about the other. I mean, if I, I'm curious to ask Leo because you've done more Shakespeare than I have. I, last year I did Richard II, which was the first which I also major thought. Shakespearean part I've ever played. And Trevor Nunn, who directed it, insisted I had to be an English king. So there I was on stage with 24 British actors who had grown <laughs> up with it, and they've all done it. And it was a real, I mean, it was a big challenge. But the language is a big challenge, and there were a whole number of things. But I'm curious about what you're... What, what do you feel when you're doing? I, I think you know, like 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 uh, Brian was saying about the Irish. I think that uh, everyone knows that Shakespeare is a sort of galvanizing element of the Jewish community. So. <laughs> 
No. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it. Uh, I. Um, <coughs> I was thinking about this while you guys were talking because I, I think, what the hell, why the hell have I done so much Shakespeare? I'm not <laughs> in my mind. You know, um, but I think that um, probably a big part of it is that I was always attracted to musical language, rhythms, language rhythms got me. Um, and um, and I, in a very real way, I think that uh, this thing that is theater, theatrical literature, film, all of this stuff has been my education, you know? And I got the sense that, that there was something um, expansive about Shakespeare, that there was something that, uh, that there was something that um, was going to push me further. Macbeth does murder sleep. The innocent sleep. Sleep that knits up the raveled sleeve of care, the death of each day's life, sore labor's bath, balm of hurt minds, great nature's second course, chief nourisher in life's feast. What do you mean? Still it cried, sleep no more, to all the house. Glam's hath murdered sleep, and therefore Cawdor shall sleep no more. You know, Andre Serban used to say to me, it's, uh, he said that all of us sort of live here and that Shakespeare is up here. And it was a weird thing to say to an actor, but I got what he meant, which was that you, were, you, had, you, had, to, you had to find a way to let go of yourself and expand consciousness to reach these characters in a human way. And I, I just always thought that was so much, f that was not only so much fun, it was I was learning so much from it all the time that I kept wanting to go back there. And I think that I've also always, it's probably evident from my film, I've always loved old things. I just like old things. I love things that make me feel... Like my favorite thing about the Seder is I'm not a very Jewish person. I make that as a joke to sort of compensate for being so large. But I, my favorite thing about the Seder is that ultimately, at the end of the day, you're being reminded of your connection to people ancient people and there's an immediacy to our sense of relatedness and uh, and there's something about Shakespeare that I love being part of the continuum mm. I love imagining doing Richard the second now knowing that you've done it I really love that <coughs> and I love going back and looking at every actor I've ever who's ever committed anything to film I love looking at everybody's performance I love Knowing that I'm a part of something that has been around for hundreds of years before me and will continue to be around for hundreds of years after me, there's something about that. And I think for me, it's, all, it's always that kind of hub of feeling connected to something. He's touched on exactly <coughs> what it is about working at the Old Vic that's so <coughs> remarkable. I was the 12th Richard II in mm -hmm. the history of the Old Vic, Gilgood being one of them, Michael Redgrave being another. And you go back and you look at these photographs and costume choices and... And I just thought, wow, you know, I, it's a little bit the way I feel about O'Neill. Someone said to me, uh, you know, did you see Jason's performance? And I said, no. And in fact, I know it's on film, but I've avoided it because so I'm such a of. huge Jason fan and I'm prone to imitation that I thought it's probably best I don't see this until it's all over and I'll, I'll watch it sometime. But I, I, I sort of corrected the person who said, you know, I'll never be able to get that performance out of my mind. And I said, well, that may be true. But I also think that one of the great, incredible things that it's nice to remind ourselves of every now and then is that we, are, we don't own parts. We are just the mm. current custodians yeah, of right. them. And I love the idea that <clears throat> in 10 years or 15 years or whatever it is, that some other group of actors will take on Moon and have a different vision of it and have a different take on the characters. And that's why I think these plays live and why Shakespeare lives, because he can even survive bad productions yeah. and terrible performances, because the plays are so solid and the writing is so dynamic and so, so in, you know, we see ourselves in, the, in this work that I think that's one of the great things that we have to remind ourselves is, yeah, we are fortunate, we are lucky, but we are just the current custodians 
of this work. And, and it will live are, long beyond us. If the plays are good enough, the audience develops a relationship to them, as I think is probably the case, as you can see, with, with O'Neill, and uh, I certainly believe Shakespeare, and I think uh, Lanford Wilson, absolutely. If the plays are good enough, the audience develops a very personal relationship with them, and so when you work on them, you feel that sense of intimacy, ownership, in that exchange of energy with the audience, and it actually makes them kind of more exciting. Um, it's like the impossible thing about playing Hamlet. The really, that, that's the, 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 hyper, uh, the hyper, uh, hyper extension of that idea, is that the reason, the reason Hamlet is so difficult is not because of the lines. The reason Hamlet is so difficult is because the audience is Hamlet, and they know it, <laughs> and they don't buy you for one second being them. <laughs> and, and that's the thing that I think certain great writers keep achieving is intimate relationships to the audience, and that's why they're fun to act, because you get to be in that relationship with them when you do that play. The last time I saw Richard Harris, we were <coughs> sitting next to each other, obviously, in somebody's uh, house oh. seats at a, at a play, and uh, I'd, I'd known him years ago. In fact, we drank a little bit together. Desmond's long gone, and Jimmy Ray's also long gone. So I said, what are you doing? He says, he says uh, he's, and he looked pretty bad. He was, this was only six months or so before he died. He says, well, I, I'm, I'm thinking I'm going to do Hamlet next year. <laughs> <laughs> Which is not exactly what you hear every day from a 65-year-old man, obviously not in the best of shape. I said, really? He says, I've talked to Gary Hines at, uh, at the Druid in Galway, and she's all f in favor of the idea. He says, I think now, finally, I begin to understand the part, <laughs> <laughs> and I think I'm going to play it. I said, I think that's a hell of an idea, and I did, and I do. Who played Gertrude? He didn't, he didn't, <laughs> he didn't live that long. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, who played Gertrude? But that's a great story about Rick, Rex Harrison doing his fifth or sixth uh, run uh, tour of uh, My Fair Lady, and uh, at 80. 81 years old playing uh, Henry Higgins. I found out all this when I did the, the thing up at the Philharmonic a few weeks ago. And the woman who played his mother was the original mother in the original production. Kathleen Nesbitt. Kathleen Nesbitt was playing his mother. She was 93. And they're at the Airy Crown Theater in Chicago. <coughs> it was a matinee. You know, they've been doing it thousands of times. <laughs> and at one point, of course, Henry Higgins walks up to her. She's sitting on a window seat. And she says, Mother, what do you think about going to the races this afternoon? This is the ascot thing. She says, Don, Mother, how, would you like to go to the races <laughs> this afternoon? And Kathleen Nesbitt looks at him and she says, Darling, I'd love to, but I'm doing a play with Rex Harrison. <laughs> 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 yes, you can keep doing it, but at some point, perhaps it's best to. <laughs> There's something fascinating that keeps coming up. You all keep mentioning other actors and performances that you've seen. And I'm wondering, when you go to the theater or watch a film or television, can you enjoy it just for what it is, or are you always looking at how other performers do what they do? I'm always looking at, at um, the choices. I'm fascinated by the choices and I think once you get into a certain room where you have a career and you can make this your life to go see for instance these three guys I, I you know you'd sit there and go wow okay wow oh wow oh, he's doing it that way you just it's a fast because it's just a script you know Richard the second it's a script and this is how Kevin but chose to do it but I, you know you know I love tell you, you know when you're seeing you know, I, 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 think I, that's I don't true. get lost in plays anymore I wish I did but I, I think really that's don't. true but what happens is when you see a really good performance that stops when no, I'm really me, when, I'm, when I'm really I, affected by me, when, when somebody and I'll know right away the minute they come on stage all of a sudden that part of me shuts off and the audience part just shuts on and I become part of the audience and that's that's when I know when I walk out at intermission or at the end of the play and say yeah. I cease to be a uh, a critic and a, 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 a you know a someone taking notes and I find this I is true, true. I, I, that <clears throat> I have to say I love more than anything when I go into a movie or I go into a theater and I see somebody give a performance particularly that I didn't think they were capable of giving because I had decided already they were this or they were that. And it's extraordinary when you see somebody 
who has been presented with a challenge and they rise to the level. And I love nothing more than, I mean, it, 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 it will come back, but I love nothing more than being able to disappear and be taken to a world that I didn't know I was going to be taken to. And in a way, you know, when I read a play for the first time, I have a, a, an, an experience when I read it. It does something to me. And sometimes I think that the course of rehearsal is sort of taking that all apart and wanting to put it back together so that the audience has that experience I had when I read it. Because that's when it first touched me. Obviously, you, you dig and you find out lots of things about it you didn't know and discoveries that a director will help you make. But I love that experience of being able to be taken somewhere, either in a reading a, a, of a script or when I go to the theater and I am magically transported. Yeah, transcendence, uh, which is the word, it doesn't happen very often. But it happens enough so that it keeps you coming back. <laughs> and uh, you, you, it's funny, you walk up, some, I, I can remember performances where I come off the stage and an actor you've been working with for three months is looking at you in a different way. And you can tell in their eyes. They, they don't say anything. And you go back on and something else happens and something else happens and you come off and it's, I understand exactly that Olivier Quay because you have no idea why. Why did that happen then and not tomorrow? Because I know it won't happen tomorrow. Mm. There's no calculation, but it's enough to keep you coming back. All of you have achieved extraordinary success and you are all highly recognizable and known. I'm wondering whether once you've achieved a level of fame, that has an impact on the work you do and how you feel about your own work. Yeah, I do. I wish I was anonymous sometimes when I'm working because I think that what ends up happening is that fans, not fans, just general audience, come in and watch a performance. They are not only watching a performance and it's your job to try to get them to forget all the other work that they've seen and just go into that character and that place. But I do think that's, that, I think that when you're just, when I go and I see a play and there's an actor or an actress on stage, I have no idea who they are. Sometimes the understudy goes on and gives a phenomenal performance and you go, what a great actor. You know nothing about them. You just know that performance. And I think sometimes there's, I mean, I, look, I, I come from a school of thought that there's way too much infotainment and way too much information about people and just way too much blather on about celebrity. And, and I, I actually used to think the word celebrity meant you celebrated someone's work. I don't think it means that anymore. Um, I, I, find it, I, I find it so great when there's <laughs> that anonymity. And when you can actually, I, I'll tell you when I feel the most satisfied is when people refer to the characters that I've played as three-dimensional. When they talk about the character mm -hmm. and use the character's name rather than mine, then I go, well, maybe I got close to doing my job that time because that character came through. Leah? Yeah. I haven't, you know, ha I don't have it as bad as Kevin has. Kevin has a real problem. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I think that it's, I, I would agree about film, you know. I do, I do, I do really love not knowing too much about the actors. I really want to believe that they are who they are. But I, I, I love that uh, um, outline of, of an act from Brecht, the, 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 the three responsibilities of an actor. He says that um, one is to, uh, and I'm, I'm going to misquote this, uh, one is to, you're responsible to play the role you've been contracted to play. And these, th these three things you're supposed to be at all times on stage. One is to play the role you've been contracted to play. Two is to be, uh, to, to be an actor playing the role that you've been contracted to play. And three is to be a member of a socio-political society who happens to be an actor who happens to be playing a role. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. And part of why I love theater so much, uh, apart from film, and I, I love them both, but particularly in film, is that there is for me no suspension of disbelief. I am an actor. You know who I am. Does that make what I'm saying any less vital or any less important? And can I find a way to accept that relationship and work through it as an actor. That, that's, that's, my, that's my goal in terms of technique, is how do I use that thing that you think to open you? And, um, and I, 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 uh, 
I really, I really love that. I mean, I really love that element of it. And it, it, it gets annoying, I think, when you are, you know, a real big movie star that there's a certain level of people who aren't really even interested in the play. That's the problem, that they're not there to see the play. They're there to see their image of you as the movie star. And I think that that probably... But there's an upside to, to that, Moore. too, I think. There's an, yeah. And the upside for me is that... Exposing them to something new. Yeah, right. because, look, mm -hmm. I, I, I often say, I don't care why they buy tickets. You know, if somebody who's 15 or 16 years old wants to buy tickets because they saw me do Superman right. or they saw you do a, a film, fine. Our job is to give them an experience in the theater on that day right. that they won't ever forget. And maybe the next time someone invites them to a play, they won't make a face. And they'll go, yeah, I had a really, it was, theater was more exciting than I ever thought it would be. I hear that from kids all the time yeah. who've never gone to the theater. And they say, I never thought theater could be that dynamic. And that what <coughs> what happens to me all the time is that people come up to me and say, God, I, you're, you're, you're really a great actor. I really, you know, I saw you do this performance years ago with, uh, Julie Harris in uh, this play called Gin Game. And I say, you mean Charlie Dirty? <laughs> yeah, Charlie Dirty. <laughs> you're Charlie Dirty, right? Yeah. That's a, I tell you, you're a hell of an actor, Mr. Dirty. I always say, thank you very much. Yeah, I the, do you next sign time it, I see him, do you sign it, next Charlie time Dirty. I see him, I'll tell him. <laughs> <laughs> but the truth is, uh, it, it happens all the time. I saw it happen to Jack Lemmon. <laughs> Someone was absolutely convinced Jack Lemmon was not Jack Lemmon. And I get complimented on Reservoir Dogs all the time. I have no <laughs> idea who I'm supposed to be. <laughs> Harvey Keitel. Yeah, I don't know who I am. It could be Michael Maxson. I don't know who I am. someone else. No, they're <laughs> mixing up usual suspects. That <laughs> I don't mind being Charlie Durning. I love Charlie Durning. He's a lot older than I am, but let it pass. And Jeff, Chelsea, Michigan versus coming to New York to be in a play? The, the, the fame issue? Does, does it play differently? Back home now? Uh, there are many more Dumb and Dumber fans back in the world. <laughs> <laughs> I will say that. Oh, uh, my son is one or, of them. Or if the Dumb and Dumber fans are here, they're, they're closet <laughs> Dumb and Dumber <laughs> uh, They're too busy. Uh, yeah. No, it's... Um, I, I agree with Kevin. Uh, whatever gets your butt in that seat, uh, great. Now, it, it is. It, it's our job now to take you someplace that you didn't think mm -hmm. we were going to go. And I'm going to let that be the final word. You all take us to many places we don't expect to go, and we're very glad to get there. And I want to thank you all for being with us today. The American Theatre Wing's Working in the Theatre is brought to you from the Graduate Center at the City University of New York with our longtime partners, CUNY TV. On behalf of the American Theatre Wing, thank you for joining us for another edition of Working in the Theatre. <laughs>